my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow Breast Pumps has helped thousands of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps and maternity compression and postpartum recovery products. And they take care of everything, including all the paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials shipped straight to your door. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. New bonus, you can use the promo code TBH15 in their online shop for 15% off all supplies and accessories. All you have to do is go to Aeroflow Breast Pump's website and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Be sure to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour so they will know that we sent you. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Sarah about her experience using Aeroflow to get her breast pump for free through insurance. So stay tuned for that chat at the end of the episode. Today's birth story guest is Allison. Allison's going to be sharing her induction birth story at 41 weeks. She talks about how the doctor used forceps and it was kind of a crazy experience, but it did work to get baby out. And then she talks a lot about postpartum and how hiring a postpartum doula was the right decision for her, especially during COVID when an in-person doula wasn't an option for her birth. Allison was actually part of our sort of cohort of Know Your Options childbirth course students that joined during COVID, and she was on the regular Zoom calls that we had, so we got to know her. We're kind of making our way through sharing those students' birth stories, and I was really excited to connect with Allison and hear the full story for the podcast today. If you're interested in joining the Know Your Options childbirth course, I get messages every single week about whether it's open right now, whether there's a discount code, and both of those things are a yes. You can find it at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the coupon code 100OFF to get $100 off enrollment. I won't go into a bunch of the details about the course here because if you just go to thebirthhour.com slash course, you can find all that info really easily. Plus, Allison talks a lot about the course in this episode. She also mentions our back to work breastfeeding course, which comes for free with the enrollment of the Know Your Options Childbirth course. But you can also get it on its own if you're just interested in that course, which covers all things pumping and getting baby to take a bottle, milk storage, all those things. We're actually working right now on kind of revamping it a little bit, giving it a new title since back to work breastfeeding doesn't really encompass everyone's story, but there's good information there for everyone. So you can find that one by heading over to thebirthhour.com and just clicking on the little courses tab in the upper right hand corner and both courses will actually drop down from that menu and you can click on either one of those. All right, enough about that. Let's get to Allison's birth story. Hi, Allison. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. It's so good to be here. This has been a long time coming. <laughs> Yay. All right. Well, will you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So I live in Vallejo, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area with my husband, Devin, and our seven-month-old daughter, Finley. All right. So let's start with finding out you were pregnant with her. Yeah. So actually, a little bit of backstory before we head into that. Okay. I have always been kind of a birth nerd. I've been listening to this podcast for years, like long before I was pregnant. <laughs> and I always loved uh, watching TLC's A Birth Story. Mm, me too. <laughs> yeah. So, and I always cry during mm. birth videos, mm. especially when the mom and the baby first meet. Yeah. I actually bought the Know Your Options course uh, before I was even pregnant. <laughs> So funny when we were emailing to get this recording scheduled, I found some of those old emails when you were asking me about it. You were like living in China or something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I longed for a baby for about six years. At first, when I was younger, in my younger 20s, I didn't really want kids. And then it was just like a switch flip. And 
And finally, I I just got this really intense baby fever. (laughs) But my life was obviously like not ready for a baby. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have, I was, you know, just beginning my career. And so finally, I got everything into place. (laughs) And uh, after teaching in China for 10 months, came back and my partner, Devin, and I, we bought a house, we got married and got pregnant, found out we were pregnant all within a span of five months. So once I got back from China, we really just hit the ground running and didn't waste any time. And so wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I was pregnant. All right. (laughs) So then I found out that I was pregnant in December of 2019. It's a little bit of a long story, but it's pretty funny looking back now. I remember my period was late, uh, but I I didn't want to get my hopes up. And so I waited like a week after my period was due. So I told myself my period was due on a Friday. And so I told myself, I'm going to wait until the next Friday. But I couldn't wait that long. <laughs> Uh, because I was driving to work one day and a song came on in the car that made me cry. And I love music, but I don't usually cry at songs. And so I was like, okay, I need to take a test right now. And so the next part kind of is a comedy of errors uh, almost because I got to the Walgreens and it was closed, of course. It was too early. So I went to work. I waited until my lunch break and it was raining. And the plan was to walk to Walgreens during my lunch break and buy the test. But then I couldn't find a working umbrella. (laughs) And so I went back and forth like three times, up and down the stairs three times to just to find a working umbrella at my work. (laughs) And so I finally found one and I hustled over to Walgreens and I just went straight to the back of the, you know, pregnancy aisle got the cheapest pregnancy test I could find, and then went straight to the cashier. And then there was only one other woman ahead of me in line, and she was taking forever to check out. And she just kept going through, you know, all these phone numbers to find her rewards, something like that. But the cashier, her name was Allie, which is my nickname. And so I was like, oh, it's a sign. And (laughs) so finally, this woman left, and I just paid for my pregnancy test and ran back. And then I went to the bathroom on the same floor as my office, and it was closed. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And so I went up to the third floor. That one was open. Everything was fine. I went to the big stall, and there was a changing station in the big stall, another sign. So I put all my stuff on the changing station. I take the test. I wait, you know, the most excruciating three minutes of anyone's life. (laughs) And I put the test back onto the changing station. And then the three minutes finally went off and I looked at the test on the changing station and there was nothing like no line, not even like a control line, (laughs) nothing. And so I was like, what the heck is going on? And so I flipped over the test. It was upside down and there were two lines. (laughs) I was like crying in the bathroom, freaking out. I didn't care who else was in there. And it just finally felt real that I was actually going to have a baby. I had wanted this for so long and it was finally real. So, but that's not it. (laughs) I went back to work and I decided to write a a letter to my husband, Devin. And I had this whole plan that I was going to put the letter on top of the pregnancy test. It was going to be right there for when he got home. He used to take the ferry into work. So I knew exactly when he was going to be home. And then I was home cooking just minding my own business and I hear a knock at the door and I'm like what that can't be him but he's not supposed to be back and it was my mother-in-law and her friend and so then the pregnancy test was like right there (laughs) in the doorway and I I just thought oh no my mother-in-law is gonna find out before her son (laughs) And so I like blocked the pregnancy test with my body and like made up some excuse about why they couldn't come in. 
And they were just dropping by and I say hi. And so they didn't stay for too long. And then finally, Devin came home and I heard him coming up the steps. And then I heard him talking on the phone. And I was like, oh, oh no, he's going to find out while he's on the phone. That is, that can't be. And so I, again, like blocked the test with my body and he thought I was a real weirdo, just like staring, waiting for him at the door. But then he finally hung up the phone and he saw the letter and then he picked up the letter and found the test and his reaction was like, wow, that was fast. (laughs) And then we both hugged and cried. And so that was the story. (laughs) I could just imagine like how many times in that day your heart rate (laughs) was so Oh my God. (laughs) So many times. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So eventful beginning. How did your pregnancy go? So physically, my pregnancy was pretty easy. I just had some random symptoms, you know, things that I never really heard of. I'd done all this research. I thought I knew everything about pregnancy. I knew all the symptoms, but turns out I knew nothing. (laughs) So I didn't have any nausea or vomiting. I just had some food sensitivities. I really couldn't stand salsa. (laughs) I just bought two giant Costco cans of salsa. (laughs) And so every time I would look in the refrigerator and see the salsa, I would just almost vomit. And I love salsa. So it's it's really weird. Um, I also had some round ligament pain, which I also didn't know was a thing. Other than that, physically pretty, pretty easy. And then in my second trimester is when COVID hit. Yeah. (laughs) And so, you know, I still had a super easy pregnancy, but my mental health and my emotional health just really plummeted. And I had to cancel my in-person baby shower. I had a Zoom shower which was great. You know, it, it had some benefits like people from other parts of the country could come who wouldn't be able to otherwise. But I was really, really sad that I couldn't share my pregnancy with the world and with my friends and with family other than, you know, on Zoom or FaceTime or something like that. And I just really grieved the loss of this experience, my first pregnancy experience. And so I had a little prepartum depression and my doctor authorized for me to leave work early due to some mental distress. And so I went on a disability about a month before I gave birth. But I did connect virtually with the mom's group. So that kind of, you know, put a fire under me to to really reach out and kind of make lemonade out of lemons. And uh, one of those groups, as you know, is the Know Your Options uh, Facebook group. Mm -hmm. So um, I connected with you guys and I have some other groups and no offense to them, but this was definitely my favorite and and still is. So big shout out. (laughs) So good. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I just sort of battled with this duality of being eternally grateful that I was healthy and that the baby was healthy, but, you know, feeling that and feeling very sad about this experience being taken away from me. And so that was really, really hard to deal with, but definitely a growing and learning experience for sure. Yeah. In the last few weeks um, of my pregnancy, I actually developed a carpal tunnel in my hands, Mm -hmm. which is also a super random thing that I had no idea that could happen. Yeah. Lesser known symptom. Yeah, exactly. And so everything was fine up until the last few weeks. I was being woken up every hour by my hands because they would fall asleep. And I was getting really, really frustrated because I was like, I just want to meet my baby. I want my baby to be waking me up in the middle of the night, not my hands. (laughs) You know, it was ridiculous. And so starting at 37 weeks, I just tried 
everything to induce naturally. Well, almost everything. This is August, mind you. I did things that a pregnant woman in the middle of August should never do. I walked up stairs. I, you know, I, I did curb stepping. I ate like two whole pineapples. I ate like five uh, cases of dates from Costco. It was kind of ridiculous. But I tried everything except castor oil. I was afraid of castor oil. So I did everything possible to try to induce naturally. I really wanted to go into labor at home and labor in my bathtub. I just had this whole vision, right? I had mentally built up everything in my mind beforehand. And obviously, none of that came to fruition, <laughs> as, you know, is, is common. Uh, so... I tried everything to get this baby out. My due date came and went. I remember I had an appointment with my OB at 40 weeks exactly. And he had suggested inducing me at 39 weeks, but I wanted to wait, see if the baby would come earlier. And so we got to 40. And so we scheduled an induction for 41 weeks. And I'm telling you, Bryn, that week between my appointment and the induction day, I made it my full-time job to try to induce this baby naturally. I went even more hardcore. I looked up these videos on YouTube, these exercises that like guarantee you to go into labor like the next day. <laughs> and then I lost my mucus plug like the day or two before uh, my induction date. And so I was like, wow, this is, this is actually happening. But then I found out that losing your mucus plug could mean like another week or so uh, before labor actually starts. And so we got to the Friday of 41 weeks and we went to the hospital. It was actually a pretty non-stressful hospital trip. That was my one fear was being in labor in the car. And so none of that <laughs> happened. So that was the whole thing. I wanted to avoid a medical induction, but you know what? I tried everything and that was the only thing that worked. Yeah. So how did that go? How did they decide to start it and everything? Yeah, we went in and they didn't test us for COVID. We just got our temperature checks and had to wear masks, of course. Mm -hmm. But it was in the evening, actually. So they suggested starting with the Foley bulb along with misoprostol, mm -hmm. but I did not want that. <laughs> um, I wanted a chill night. And so I opted for just the Foley bulb for the first night. And the doctor who put it in, she checked me and I was about one and a half centimeters dilated and like 70% effaced at that moment when we first got there. And the Foley bulb was fine. I was really worried about it being painful, but it wasn't. The only annoying thing was that the doctor didn't tape the catheters to my leg. And so I was kind of just like flopping around. Um, but then a nurse came in and she asked me if I wanted them taped to my leg. And I said, yes. <laughs> and so I got some sleep that night. They gave me kind of like a Benadryl to help me sleep. I think my husband actually slept better than I did, and he was on the little pull-out couch. I swear, those couches are more comfortable than the hospital beds. <laughs> but then in the morning, um, we started on miso, and I labored that whole day, and it was actually it was pretty chill. I was dancing. I was on the, the birth ball. We were walking around the room. We couldn't like walk around the hospital hallway, obviously. But, you know, I went back and forth on that in that room and things were starting to ramp up. And then they gave me another dose of miso and that really ramped things up. And so that combination of the Foley bulb, they took that out, obviously. And the miso got me to five centimeters. And they just sort of let my body go from there. And I didn't have Pitocin after that for a while. <laughs> and my body just sort of kicked into gear. 
and I was really feeling it <laughs> by that evening. That was a Saturday evening, and I was going back and forth to the bathroom and trying to labor on the toilet, and then I finally got the idea to go into the shower. And I'm telling you, Bryn, I got so much relief in the shower. It was incredible. And I was just having Devin in there, like spraying, going back and forth, spraying my belly, spraying my back. And it was such a big relief being in the water. Power of water is pretty awesome in labor. For some people, some people hate it, but... Yeah, exactly. I really wish that I could have had a tub. I, I kind of regret not going the tub route, but my hospital didn't have it. So <laughs> so later that evening, they checked me again and I was seven centimeters and just in a lot of pain. <laughs> I initially told them that I didn't want them to offer me any pain medication, that I knew it was there. And so I would request it if I wanted it. And I also knew, you know, the cardinal sin of labor to ask for an epidural while you're in a contraction. And so I waited and it was getting really bad. And so I asked for some relief and they gave me options, of course. And we started out with fentanyl because I wanted to kind of put off the big guns, <laughs> the epidural, um, and see if I could just get some relief with the fentanyl. But uh, that did not work for me at all. The fentanyl did nothing, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, but I got no relief. And so I just remember clutching the side of the bed and requesting the epidural because <laughs> I, I just got no relief from that. And so I got the epidural and actually something weird happened while I was getting the epidural. My IV in my wrist, the area in my wrist where the IV was started swelling a lot. And I looked down and I was like, oh my God. And then the nurse looked down and she was like, oh my God. And so they changed my IV. The nurse was like poking around in my other arm while the anesthesiologist was prepping. And it was just a lot. And so, but luckily Devin could stay in the room. They did everything in the room, of course. And so once I had the epidural, I had about, you know, a couple more contractions and then everything started to feel a lot better. And that was probably around midnight. And so I finally went to sleep and then I slept for like two or three hours. Not very well. It was like a weird numb sleep, <laughs> it felt like. Uh, but I had relief and finally. So they came in and woke me up and they checked me and I was fully dilated. I was at 10 centimeters. And so it was time for some practice pushes. And by that time, you know, the epidural had started to wear off a little bit. So it was basically a walking epidural at that point. And so I was able to push in all different positions. And the people at the hospital, the nurses and the doctors were really, really open to that. And so I, I pushed in every position imaginable, but we weren't making a ton of progress, unfortunately. The baby's head was still stuck in the birth canal. And so we had an ultrasound and they found out that the baby was sunny side up. We didn't know the sex of the baby, by the way, at this point. <laughs> um, spoiler alert, she was a girl. But uh, at this point, we didn't know. And so they did an ultrasound and she was sunny side up. And so we tried the peanut ball going back and forth on each side with the peanut ball. And that actually worked, which was pretty amazing. Did the hospital just have peanut balls on hand or did you bring it with you? Yeah, they did. That's awesome. No, they did. They had it. Yeah, it was amazing. So she was still stuck and not making good enough progress at the four-hour pushing mark. So they gave me three options. You can either go for another hour and then we'll have to try either vacuum extraction or a C-section. And I really did not want to have a C-section. I don't think there's anything wrong with them, but I knew that I could do it without 
that option. And so I, I wanted to exhaust everything before going there. But there was a caveat with these options. They said that the OB on call was particularly skilled in kind of manually turning the baby in order to get the baby's head out. And also he was one of the only OBs in the practice who was still really well trained in forceps. And so I was like, okay, I'll do the forceps. <laughs> and I think also being that close to a C-section really motivated me um, to push the baby out. So we brought in the OB and the forceps came out and I'll never forget like the metal clanging um, of this just straight up medieval tool. Uh, it was pretty wild. So he first tried to manually turn the baby and that wasn't really working. And then he tried the forceps and that didn't work the first time. But then the second time was the charm. And with one push, out came her head. And then the next push was her body. And on 8.19 a.m. on August 23rd, my daughter Finley was born. And so that's the whole labor and delivery part of it. <laughs> Do you remember the placenta part? I feel like some people really don't and others do. How was that? No, actually, it was kind of crazy because one thing I was really worried about was retaining the placenta. Mm -hmm. And so her body coming out just felt like this earthquake inside of my body. I was used to pushing really, really hard, and I could not believe that she was outside of my body. <laughs> And so the doctors told me that the placenta was coming and he told me to push. And so I gave like one gigantic push and it just shot out. I swear to God, he almost didn't catch it. And he was like, whoa, 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 like <laughs> slower, slower. Oh, wow. But it was out. It was out and I saw it for a hot second. And so I didn't, didn't have to worry about retaining any placenta, luckily. Before that, he was doing the fundal massage, which I always heard was terrible. I was in a lot of pain from delivering that way with the forceps, I think, especially. So when he was doing the fundal massage, I just remember saying out loud, I was like, oh, this fundal massage isn't too bad. And the whole room with the doctors and the nurses started cracking up. And this one doctor said, you know, you're, you know, you're a rock star mom if you say that the fundal massage isn't too bad. <laughs> yeah, they probably don't hear that very often. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I heard him requesting um, a hemorrhage kit. And so I got really freaked out and I asked him, am I hemorrhaging? And he said, no, I just want to have it there just in case. Um, I didn't end up hemorrhaging, thank goodness, but it was, it was a little scary. The baby, she was placed on me for about two seconds and then they had to take her away because she wasn't breathing. And she wasn't crying. And so they took her away to the warming table. And I didn't hear her cry for what felt like forever. And there was this one nurse who was with us the whole time. Her name is Danielle. I feel like there's always that one nurse, you know, that holds it down for you. And so she was there. And I just remember grabbing her hand and looking into her eyes and saying, is she going to be okay? And Danielle was like, yeah, she's fine. She just needs a little help breathing. They're giving her oxygen right now. And she said that this was really difficult for her too. And so, yeah, that was really, really, really scary. Um, sorry, this is the part where I might cry. Um, but... Uh, she she cried, obviously, eventually, and I wasn't I wasn't convinced that that she was okay until I heard the second cry, and then um, my husband Devin went over to the warming table and he was able to cut her umbilical cord, and he took some pictures, and it was um, it was not soon after that that um, she was able to come to me. And they put her on my chest and there, there are pictures of it that are like, you know, I have like one eye closed and like crying, like reaching for the baby and just like totally, you know, a wreck. But 
just so, so happy to have my baby. And she was just the most beautiful newborn baby I had ever seen. And she was finally mine. And I just kept saying, like, I'm your mommy, I'm your mommy. And it was just really a beautiful moment. And we were able to have the golden hour, which was fabulous. And, um, you know, then we went into postpartum recovery and she, she latched right away with breastfeeding. And that was, that was great. So, you know, it was kind of a, a little bit, um, traumatic. And we also, uh, took a video of everything and, biggest mistake of my life because I watched that video over and over again and I saw things that you know no mother wants to see and so uh, I I regret taking that video but I, I wanted that moment of you know seeing my baby for the first time and both of us crying and I didn't really get that until a little bit later on but um, but she, she's, she was perfect and has been perfect. Uh, so we're, we're very, very grateful and happy that everything turned out. Okay. <laughs> I remember you telling this story on our zoom call and we were all yeah. emotional. And- oh yeah. Yeah. All right. So how was your long-term experience postpartum once you got home? Postpartum is really rough on yeah. me, as I think it is for, for most women. And, you know, my friends who had already had babies, they tried to tell me, you know, but I wasn't hearing it. And you really, you just don't know until you know. Everything was great with Finley. Uh, breastfeeding uh, was challenging in the beginning, of course, but uh, went really well. And actually, she came home from the hospital right during fire season in California. And there weren't fires in our immediate area, but there were fires close by. And we could actually smell the smoke from inside our postpartum recovery room. So I felt really bad that kind of the first outside air that she was breathing was was this fire, horrible smoke. But we got home and had lots of help with uh, the in-laws. They all took COVID tests and quarantined and did an amazing job of, of keeping us safe. And my mom came Came up from Southern California, and actually, the best decision that I could have made was hiring a postpartum doula. And so I, I knew that I would need that help, and I, I wanted a doula for the the birth as well. But I knew that it would have to be virtual, and so this way we could have our doula at home with us. And I credit her with my success with breastfeeding early on and with getting any sort of sleep uh, during those first few weeks. And so that was, uh, that was a game changer for sure. Yeah, it was a real shock to the system because I knew it would be hard. But like I said, I didn't know how hard it was going to be just taking care of myself and a newborn. And so it was rough. (laughs) But we managed and she did beautifully with breastfeeding and has ever since. So I'm extremely, extremely grateful for that. However, she didn't take a bottle (laughs) and we struggled for months with getting her to try a bottle, but we finally managed to get her the bottle thanks to the back to work breastfeeding course. (laughs) Yay! Yeah, so that was super helpful. And I think we tried the intermittent bottle by mom that Stephanie talked about in the class and that's what did it. And it really came at the perfect time for us because right before Finley turned three months, I ended up in the ER with a gallbladder attack. And I knew that I had 
gallstones and I knew that pregnancy would make them worse. And so I had that in the back of my mind, but when the attack came, it was really bad. If, if labor and delivery is a 10, then this was like an eight or a nine. I was just doubled over miserable with this gallbladder attack. And so I opted to have the surgery and that's when Finley taking the bottle really came in handy uh, because I had, you know, abdominal surgery. And so I couldn't do certain positions with breastfeeding. And by that time she was too big for a football hold. And so uh, she, she's a big girl. And so we, uh, we had to get her on that bottle. So I definitely credit the back to work breastfeeding course for, for that too. I also struggled with a little bit of postpartum anxiety um, and that book that Rachel always talks about really helped me. The Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which she talked about in her birth story. Um, So yeah, I also had some postpartum OCD uh, with that video. Um, I just would watch it over and over again, just obsessively. and, And that was really traumatic after watching that video. But then I also had some postpartum insomnia, which I still kind of struggle with today, but I'm, I'm working on it. So it's getting a little bit better. I had a good night's sleep last night. So that's good. <laughs> good. But Finley sleeps like a dream. You know, we worked on some sleeping stuff, but we never had to really formally sleep train her. Yeah, she's been great and still healing, but getting there and our Zoom meetings just have helped a lot. Uh, Everyone is so honest and so real and we laugh together, we cry together. Mm -hmm. And I just love that meeting, that time with with other moms. And (laughs) I feel really bad for the pregnant women because this sort of cohort that we've established with the moms who have already had their babies and we (laughs) we just, we just no holds barred, like just just talk about everything. (laughs) And (laughs) I feel bad for maybe scaring them but hopefully it it helps them too I think it's good because like you guys who already have your babies say it's like okay no one's ever talked about an anal fissure before and we have like five people in that group that have had that yeah we can talk about hemorrhoids it's amazing yeah exactly I love those calls so much they also make me a little jealous that I didn't have something (laughs) like that when I was pregnant or a new mom because it's so it's so good (laughs) hard to explain but so good yeah even when things open up you know we should totally keep it going because we're we come from all over the country coast to coast really and so it's really nice and even international a few people here and there exactly yeah germany germany canada (laughs) Yeah. yeah that's great And so through all of this hardship with COVID, there have been some really bright spots and that Zoom meeting that we have is is definitely one of them. For me, a big, big healing journey has been honestly going to therapy. I can't recommend it enough. And shout out to my therapist, Brittany. She helped me get through the trauma with the birth and she helped me prepare for this podcast even. So that has been a lot of help. And just having Finley in our lives is so incredible. She is a light for everyone. She's really the perfect baby. And I know I'm, I'm biased. I'm her mom, <laughs> but I just have so much hope for her mm-hmm. in the future. And I really hope that through this difficult time that she knows that she is just fiercely, fiercely loved and that she is strong and resilient and that, you know, her mom did everything in her power to keep her safe. So that's, sorry to end on that. <laughs> Everyone's got their tissues already. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. And actually, today is a huge day for me. Not only am I recording this 
birth story with you, which has been my dream for many years. I'm also getting my COVID vaccine, the first dose this afternoon. So it's a real full circle moment for me. (laughs) I can't believe it's been a year of doing those Zoom calls. And I mean, everybody's reflecting on the anniversaries of COVID and everything, but having a baby during that time just adds so much to it as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of heartache, but a lot of joy, a lot of joy. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, Allison, do you have resources? I know you've mentioned a few, but any more you want to add here at the end? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. The Know Your Options course, obviously. Thank you. Is my number one resource. Awesome. (laughs) And like I said, our Zoom meetings have been just invaluable. And then there's also another app and support group that I found during this time. And the app is called Oath. O-A-T-H. And it started out as beta, but we have um, been testing it throughout these many months. And so I have a group on there and I actually just met up with one of the women and her baby recently outdoors. And that's been really, really nice. And it's kind of a more local group, but yeah, Oath has been really, really incredible as well during this time with everything virtual. And then I also want to give a shout out to my postpartum doula, Sarah Thompson. If you are in the Bay Area and you need a postpartum doula, she is fabulous. And I actually met another woman who uh, was working with her at the same time. We Mm. just happened, she moved to my city recently and we met at a coffee shop. And so I've just been finding all these connections hmm. in real life and virtually. So yeah, big shout out to to Sarah. And then also I love YouTube and I've done, you know, a ton of research on YouTube. And so there's this one creator, her name is Nurse Zabe, Z-A-B-E. I think it's short for Elizabeth. She's a labor and delivery nurse, and she makes extremely informative YouTube videos. She's incredible. So, yeah, I I highly recommend checking her videos out as well. And I did Spinning Babies, and, you know, I think that helped a lot, too. Yeah, that's pretty much it for my resources recommendations. All right. Well, we'll link to those on your show notes page. Well, thank you so much, Allison, for coming on and sharing your story and all those great resources. Yeah, of course. I've been listening to this podcast probably since close to the beginning. I'm not sure. When did you start it? It was September 2015. Okay. I referred my friend to this podcast when she was pregnant with her baby, and he's now three years old. So (laughs) I've been listening for at least four or five years. (laughs) Well, thanks. Keep sending those friends (laughs) over to the podcast. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, it's been so great getting to know you over the last year, and I'm so happy we were able to record today. Thank you so much, Brent. I really, really appreciate it. Now we're going to talk to Sarah about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the birth hour to chat with me about Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you? Yeah, I have uh, one son named Lincoln who is almost eight months old, and I live with my husband of five years, Christian, and our two cats in Richmond, Virginia. All right. So how did you find out about Aeroflow? I found out about Aeroflow actually through this podcast. Oh, yay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, that was really great. And I, uh, I knew that I needed to get a breast pump, but insurance was really intimidating, especially because I didn't have great insurance. I was a graduate student at the time when I was pregnant. And so I wasn't sure how to, it just was really confusing. So I was really excited when I found out about Aeroflow. I was totally in the same position with my first in grad school oh, really? insurance. Yeah. And they like want you to go to, you know, the student health line of defense and stuff. Um, yeah. Anyways, so what was your experience like once Airflow and knew you wanted to go that route? Yeah, it was so easy. Like I hate talking to people on the phone, um, especially like insurance people. And I never had to do that the whole process. <laughs> um, so I, and I was, I did this when I was still pregnant. I wasn't even like, I was maybe 30 weeks. So it was pretty early on in my, I mean, not early, but you know, not super far in my pregnancy. Um, 
I went online and I filled out the form with my information. And then I got an email a couple days later that was like, we've already checked with your insurance. Here's what you qualify for. Um, and it was basically like, go spend money, you know, go, go get this, pick the one you want. And so I went on to the website, I picked the pump that I wanted. I got some advice from different people about what to choose. And I went with the Spectra S2, I think, whichever one was, was included. You could get more fancy ones if you paid a little extra, but I just went with what was included. I picked that out and maybe I had to answer like one more email, but through the whole process. And then it came like a couple weeks later in the mail and that was it. And I didn't ever have to talk to a real human. I maybe had to text like, and it came yeah, really and fast, it sounds like. It did. Yeah. So I had it plenty before my actual, the actual birth. And um, I'm really thankful because even though I had planned to exclusively breastfeed, um, I had a lot of issues with breastfeeding and I needed that pump a lot and I ended up using it a ton. And so I'm really thankful that I took the time to get one and, um, you know, that I, and I think they even do. I never actually took advantage of this and I probably should have. They'll even um, help you get replacement parts because you're supposed to replace those pump parts pretty often. And so I got a couple emails like during postpartum that was like, hey, if you need to replace your parts, like we can do that. And I just I just ended up not taking advantage of that. Um, But it seemed really easy even to do that. So they were like on top of getting replacement parts and stuff. But, yeah, the pump became like my most (laughs) <laughs> the pump I joked was like my most intimate relationship, uh, was with my breast pump during those first couple months. And so I'm really thankful that I got that taken care of and that made it so easy, um, to get that done. Yeah. I think it's a lot of people don't think about needing though they're going back to work or, um, or at all, if they're not planning to go back to work, stuff like that. But there are so many uses for it. Even like for me, I was hooked up to my breast pump when I was still pregnant, trying to get labor mm-hmm. started. Um, so yeah. it's just really nice to take care of that when you're still, you know, mostly of clear mind <laughs> before your baby arrives and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, and I, I wish that what I wish I had done is taken it out and played with it and set it up and seen how it worked, you know, um, before I had the baby. Cause I just left it even in the box. Like I didn't. And then when I had, he had a really bad latch due to a tongue tie. And, um, so I was in a lot of pain and I had to pump for a while to heal. And that allowed me to keep giving him breast milk, you know, even though I was having to stop breastfeeding for a while. And, but when I first got it out, you know, it's like this weird contraption. I was like, how does this even work? <laughs> um, so I'm really thankful that I got it early from air because of airflow. And I, my advice to anyone else would be to take it out and play with it before the baby comes. So you're not like sleep deprived and trying to figure out how this dang machine works while, you know, a baby cries. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Watch all the, the videos and everything beforehand so that you're not like just in tears <laughs> trying to yeah. figure it out. Oh, and the other thing I discovered is that there are different, so the, the breast pump comes with one size of flange. Is that how you say it? You know, like the, yeah. um, the cone thing, but that you might actually need a different size. Like I have pretty small boobs. And so I did, but I needed actually a bigger flange size. And once I changed, I got a lot more uh, milk. So I just did that because I was in like the haze of postpartum. I think I just ordered them on Amazon, but I, but like I said, Aeroflow reached out about replacement parts. So I'm pretty sure you could probably get those like through them as well. Um, but that's just something that is handy to know that I didn't know is that there's different sizes and that can impact how much you get, um, out of the pump. Yeah, that's a really good point And definitely something to ask a lactation consultant about if you're not sure. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I do think it has more to do with like your nipple size than your yeah. breast size. Definitely. Awesome. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you and I appreciate you sharing your experience with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much again to Aeroflow Breast Pumps for being a longtime sponsor of the birth hour. I really cannot recommend them enough. So please head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get all set up with that completely free to you process. If you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Allison's name in the search bar and her show notes will come up for you. That's also where Allison would love to connect with you. I will put her contact information on the show notes page so that you can get in touch and reach out to her if you'd like. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.